Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. We set out to create an entertaining and exciting podcast about law and business, and I think we've done it. Black Letter, the name, comes from the Gothic typeset that was originally used in the Gutenberg Press. Over time, Black Letter became the only font that English law books were printed in. Everything else was printed in a regular type. It made it harder for kind of the common person to understand what the English law books said. Black Letter came to represent something that was law, that was set in stone, that was sort of old and a well-settled fundamental principle of law. We're here to demystify Black Letter law. We're here to demystify things that happen in business and law and where those two meet. And I hope you have fun listening. Thank you once again for joining us for the Black Letter Podcast. Today with me, once again, not live, not in our studio, because we're still living in COVID pandemic times, I've got Sharon Burtz. Sharon is the successful former owner of FCI, a federal government contractor. Now she is an artist, an author, and a philanthropist, and so many other things. And we're going to talk about her business story, because I know that is part of the reason you guys are tuning in is to hear how, how do you build a successful business like a government contracting business and then sell it for lots of money. And we always hear about these things. And I've represented people who do it. And it's interesting as a lawyer that people come from so many directions to do these kinds of things. And we're going to talk to Sharon about that. And then we'll talk about her book, because I know that's sort of new and exciting probably more exciting to Sharon than for me that she sold her business. And then philanthropy and something called Selma Manor, which I'm familiar with because it's a local thing in Loudoun County, Virginia. But um, I know a lot of people are listening in California and Seattle and Texas and all other places. And we'll talk a little bit about historically what that is and what she's done there. And I think it sort of ties into her authorship. But anyway, I'm going on too much. Let's jump over to you, Sharon. Sharon, uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about your background and about FCI Federal and how what that is and how it came to be. Well, first, Tom, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me here today. It's a beautiful day. Probably it's not going to remain that way, but love the day in Virginia. And it's just nice to, you know, actually get on the phone. And I'd love to meet you in person, but, you know, we've got all these rules. So, you know, it's interesting you ask about, you talk about how, um, you know, we sold the business. And it's interesting to me is that when I went into starting FCI, gosh, I was going to say, I think it's 30 years ago now. Um, that was the last thing on my mind. I never thought about selling it. When I advise people now and they talk about setting up their companies, I say, you, know, you really should think about what your, what your purpose for this business is in terms of exit strategy up front. And if it's a lifestyle business, if it's something you want to just do, you know, till the day you die. But at some point, you know, there has to be an end, all good things. And so right. I was meeting yesterday with a friend of mine who's starting a government contracting firm. And I said, he says, I'm going to build it and sell it in five years. And I say, good luck to you, because it's not going to be five years. Um, but I, I love that, Sharon. So your first piece of advice is don't do what I did, which was very successful. But, you know, <laughs> think ahead of the game and yeah. have an exit strategy. Because you make a lot so, of mistakes okay. along the way that are awful, yep. costly, and awful uh, you know, they're costly and painful. Now, I started FCI. Actually, it wasn't FCI. It was a company called, it was the same company, but it was a different. Um, it was Federal Consulting. Services, Federal Consulting Inc., Fed Consulting, which was a consulting company that was helping government contractors find business in the federal government. I was nine, uh, 21 years old when I started that firm in October 1991. That's what we did for a good 10 years. We um, worked with the big systems integrators, um, small businesses, product companies, and provided consulting services in the business development market research space, uh, mostly systems, uh, you know, IT kind of jobs, but helping companies, you know, with their business development or chasing of large programs. And that business went really, really well until, oh gosh, about 2001. Uh, and it had nothing to do with 9-11, um, but everything to do with mergers and acquisitions. In the one, the beginning of 20, 20, uh, 2001, we had about 40 clients. And by the end of that year, I think we had somewhere into the next 18 months, we were down to 18 clients. Uh, and that was because- wow. Northrop Grumman would buy Logicon and, and, and right. then, you know, I've lost one account and, you know, because I already had an account with Northrop. So it really changed our business. So in 2004, I made a decision to really slow down on the consulting side of things and change the company and become a government 
contracted directly myself. All my clients were in IT and we had, you know, non-disclosures with most of them. So the non-competes, obviously. I focused on uh, business process outsource, outsourcing, uh, really the okay. processing of uh, stuff and things. And most of our work um, started with Homeland Security and uh, was immigration service. In 2007, uh, FCI Federal had um, did a couple contracts, 30 people, and one and a half million dollars um, in revenue. In 2017, when we sold on June 12th, we had of our own employees over 3,700. But when you add all those subcontractors, we actually managed as a prime. We had 5,000 yeah. employees and 42 um, states and territories, 127 offices nationwide. Yeah, well, so that's funny. So we're a contractor for Homeland Security right now ourselves, and uh, they've been interesting to work with. We've been, we, we contract with a couple of different government entities. So I'm curious. I, I was an Army officer, and that's kind of why I was like, let's get into government. Con and we represented a lot of contractors. But you were 29, just rewinds 1991. What was it that got you into government contracting or, or gave you the idea to start consulting with companies? Some proposal preparation, but most of it was um, government, understanding the programs, the nuances of a, of a government requirement, and really establishing what your win strategy is going to be and helping them with that process. I would also hire gotcha. a lot of ex-government officials who had just retired as consultants to work with clients on particular, understanding the domain that they were in, you know, the kind of business that they were in, and how the agency operated, and helping set up meetings with the government if you could really working on what your discriminators were and putting together a bid, not just, just okay. from a proposal perspective, but, you know, the strategy um, for how you were either right. win the program, it was a new opportunity, or whether you're going to take it from someone else, how you're going to beat them. Pricing strategy, technical strategy, management strategy, what kind of partnering strategy you needed to have, what kind of products you needed to bid, um, all that stuff I advised them on. How I got started, interesting, is that yeah. I was 16 and received a junior fellowship through the Department of Education. I got placed in the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I worked as a statistician support person all through college. Interestingly enough, I happened to work for the guy who was a source selection official on the HUD HIPS contract, which was a great big modernization program for Department of Housing and Urban Development Systems. I had no idea that was a big thing, right? So, you know. Right. College, I'm, I'm getting offers saying, "Hey, come work for me." I'm like, in, in marketing, I'm like, "Why?" You know, I don't know anything about marketing. Well, because I know all those guys. So I kind of got into that in the business development world right out of school. I ended up at Computer Sciences Corporation for four years, and that sure. was an education. Um, I worked the Treasury account, the Justice account, um, and the EPA account. They were pretty big clients for CSCs. Yeah, so you four years, you were four major clients. At CSC, that's that's pretty incredible. I won two billion dollars of the business for them in four years. Wow! Yeah, so when I decided to go on my own, I had um, you know I, I had a lot of uh, larger companies who you know wanted to know how I did that, and obviously I didn't do that uh, by myself. I mean, CSC had some really smart technical people, right? That put together some really great solutions, uh, and timing was right for CSC to really jump into those markets. And the, bi the big first contract that we won had to do with um, the customs data network. I met my boss had won that, but the ability to expand that treasury wide is really what helped um, push the, my reputation forward in that, in that industry. And this is back in the like 80s we're talking about. It's been a long time. So, so where did you go to college? I went to the University of Virginia. I graduated from high school. Uh, I went to Luckett's Elementary School. I'm a local gal. My family's been in this area since the 1750s, raised here, love it here, lived here all my life. I was in New York for a little while, but I hated it. Sorry, anybody from New York. It's just not my thing. I love to go to visit, but you don't, you can't take the, right. the country out of the girl, <laughs> you know? Well, I'll tell you, I was in New York yesterday, Sharon, and it is not New York right now. It is basically an empty city Same. and the Pierre's closed, the Plaza's closed, the every major five-star hotel's closed, completely closed and shuttered. So it's it's so a strange, sad. different New York. Yeah, it is. I think it'll it'll come back. This is my first meeting with my partners in a year in the city because of this pandemic. It's a weird, you know, yeah, time. In Interestingly, um, you know, so. I was up there um, in Jan end of January last year, meeting with my publisher and my my PR gal. We came back, flew out to California. We have a house out in Napa, and um, yeah. 
the COVID hit out in Sacramento, right? Area. And that's where we were. I'm like, let's, let's get home. <laughs> and then it just took over the world. So, so Sharon, I'm really interested now. So we started with the, the, that was great. The internship, you were 16 and you basically launched into federal government contracting, which that's right. unique. The evolution, 5,000 people, 2017. How did, what was the sales process like? How did you, did a company approach you and say, this is a valuable business. You have a lot of books. Or did you seek this? So in terms of the sale, am I built it? I mean, yeah. So what happened, um, it's an interesting kind of thing. It was at the end of 2015. I have four boys, by the way. My son, Luke, is uh, a deputy program manager for us at the time, um, working on okay. a project. We have the Department of State for Visa Services. We were actually sitting at a bar in New Hampshire after meeting with employees. And that actually kind of goes into this whole philanthropy story. And he said to me, you know, mom, you know, because we were trying to figure out how to incentivize them to, to do a lot better on their production um, through bonuses. And he made this comment, you know, that mom, if you gave him all the profit you made on this company, it would never be enough, right? Kind of sort of launched me into thinking about giving back into the community so that if I, instead of giving my employees all of our profits, you, you know, all of it, <laughs> and they, they 5,000 people, they go out and they spend it on a, a flat screen TV and then it'd be gone. That's what sort of incentivizes us to sort of give a lot of money um, to the hospital to build a trauma ward. But in that same token, I started thinking about what am I really trying to do? And that, that, that conversation was pretty pivotal for me. What am I trying to do? How am I really making a difference, you know, in people's lives? And yes, we do great work for the government, but I'm going to have to take on debt and buy another company and merge in some way in order to be able to feed this beast. Because once you're like that big, you know, you're not North America yeah. that big, right? But you're, you're still pretty big, but you're not big enough to compete on those great big huge jobs without partners right. and partners as in part of you with the past performance and it really sort of set me into thinking that sort of december uh november december 15 early um 16 what am i trying to do and i don't want debt we grew up around here you know no one took debt my father didn't owe anybody a dime that was kind of hard to get credit right. No debt right and um i met with a friend of mine gene stack you want to think about selling and we could do a couple things. We can, you know, go with private equity. We could you know, put you in a, in a merger, you know, with integrate into a, one of your competitors will buy you. And I didn't want to work with one of my competitors. I didn't want to do that. And so I worked with them to come up with a strategy for, for selling the organization. And at the time I hadn't told anybody on my board, I hadn't told my own, who's my husband now, but I hadn't even told him, <laughs> you know, this was kind of something I had decided to do. Like you said, I kind of fell into uh, government contracting, and I kind of fell into trying to sell it. I never, ever thought I was going to sell it. I never wanted to sell it. I'd say March of 16, I was on a path to, to package it and, and and put it out for sale because I wanted to do something different. So the kind of the reverse path of what you said, so instead of for what you advise, so you're saying when you start the company, think about how you're going to sell it and what your goal is and what your trajectory is. But you kind of, and I've heard this, your story from a lot of a lot of my clients and a lot of other businesses is that they get into the business and they love it and they're doing it because it makes sense. It makes the money and it's exciting, but they don't really have at the time they started or they're doing it an exit strategy until literally it's time to exit. And that right. seems like a more difficult path. It is difficult you know? because, you know, your accounting systems aren't quite what they should be. You know, you haven't, I mean, I was giving a ton of, of profit away to managers and employees and we were doing a lot of stuff that no other company did we had a we had really lean you know sort of lean staff but they were well compensated and and we had programs that were expensive that we used to manage our government contracts and that we used to make people happy and if you're going to go sell you don't do that stuff you want to make your profit look as great as you can you know and i should have been holding on to it so there's all those kinds of things i didn't think of other thing i didn't think about is that my business was really focused in immigration. We were, I mean, we had probably had at the time about 90% of the federal immigration services business. I mean, we had three or four contracts, uh, USCIS. We had a couple with the Department of State in the immigration visa. We processed all the visas for this country. We um, had the FBI contract doing background investigations on people trying to come into the country. We had a lot of these, a lot of immigration work. and. And again, not that 
was something I thought about, but you know, one of the, a lot of the questions we had during the whole due diligence process with different firms was the concentration of business we had in the immigration world. And there was this rumor this guy Trump might just win, you know, um, and questions are being asked. You know, this guy is going to crack down on immigration. I'll be just totally frank. You know, it works OK either way, by the way. If you've got yeah. someone in office who's going to really crack down on immigration, that means you're going to be doing more of the background investigative work, which is more, you know, which is a higher end work. It's just as right. lucrative as the processing thousands and thousands of people. So it didn't really matter to me whether it was, you know, Trump in office or or Clinton in office at the time. Either way, FCI was going to be fine. Companies don't look at it that way. They, they get all jittery. They think, oh, who's going to stop immigration? Your business is going to suffer. And I said, look, a couple of things I can guarantee you are always going to happen in this world. You're always going to have death. You're always going to have taxes. And there's always going to be immigration. It's just one of those things. So that's interesting to me because I we have government contracts clients now that are seeing this current administration pull back on military spending. And a lot of our clients are, they're anticipating and they're hearing from their contracting officers that there's going to be reductions at, or terminations or early terminations or non-renewals of options. And I mean, it's kind of a mess. So you were, you were just, ha- I don't know, if, it doesn't sound like you planned it that way, but you were in a very safe kind of administration I, agnostic deal. Like I, did, right? I did plan it that way. Fed Consulting, the old consulting company. I didn't see a couple of things coming in that 2001 timeframe. I didn't see the mergers and acquisitions killing my business. I also didn't see the competition. I was younger, wasn't quite as uh, street smart, hadn't been bitten hard, you know, um, sure. and uh, made a lot of mistakes. The business almost went under in 2002. We closed our office. I moved back home, um, had to reinvent because wow. it was a tough, 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 tough time. So I decided that was never going to happen again. So in that time frame, when I was planning for this you know, from 2002 and 2004, planning for this launch and the federal government work directly, um, I did some market analysis and I looked at the immigration space. What's nice about immigration is that it's fee for service. So if an applicant is applying for citizenship, for example, they're going to pay a fee, let's yeah. say $100. Of that yeah. dollars that they apply, you know, 10, 20% of it goes for the processing of their application, which we get. Uh, so we charge, you know, I'm, I'm making numbers up. I have no idea. We charge $8, sure. you know, to process an application. And that basically comes straight from that working capital fund that is funded by the applicant. So, so you weren't tied to appropriations as right. much. Illegal immigration is the one that has to be appropriated by Congress. Yeah. Stuff. All okay. legal immigration is not. It's all done fee for service. All done. That's really, really smart. That's so, something that a lot of people... You know, they see the dollar signs in military contracts, but what you did was really, really uh, a lot of foresight there. So I watched, I saw what happened in 96, in January of 96, when they didn't uh, appropriate the budget um, way back when, I think it was Clinton in office and the things yeah. were in the, in the house and they refused to um, appropriate money and the, the government shut down, nearly killed companies because of, of the appropriations. And I didn't want to be a tie to any political party that was in Congress or in the White House. So I really yeah. that fee for service kind of work. Now, obviously, we did have some work that wasn't fee for service, um, but most of it was. And we went after contract of the U.S. Coast Guard, processing mariner credentials, federal law enforcement training center. One of my first government contracts I won way, way, way back in like 1998, before I was even thinking about this change. And 20 years, we processed their certifications, customs, border patrol for um, oh, okay. those guys, all, gotcha. their, you know, all their training support, but we did all their graduation certificates, all their training programs. We, we don't wow. work behind that. It's all adjudication support in the background. Um, it's not actually yeah. on the front lines, except when you're doing, you know, ceremonies for immigration, you know, citizenship kind of things. But for the most part, for those back office people that you didn't see, you know, with their heads to the grindstone, typing in and processing right. all of that adjudication work, background investigative work, making sure that People are vetted properly before they become citizens or before they get a work visa, before they even come across the border. So that's wow. the work that we did. Yeah. And again, all fee for service. So pretty exciting. I, I mean, so brilliant. Well, it wasn't actually brilliant, but it was just, I thought about it. Much congratulations to you. We happened to be CDC contractors at NIH's council three years ago, and we're still in the contract and COVID hit. So we've been in this cycle of random academic government money. 
And I'll tell you, there's been times when CDC never had any money. I would never chase a job down because it never had any money. <laughs> they have money now. I mean, for yeah, some, I was like, say, now you're, 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 you're lucky, right? <laughs> Oh, they didn't, we got nothing. I'm not nothing. We had very small contracts the first two years and the third year option this last two years. Oh. Anyway, I digress. So I want to ask you, Sharon, now tell me how did, so you've transitioned, you're selling your company. Did you plan to become, I know you, you started as an artist. You had a paintbrush and canvas and somewhere in that you became a philanthropist. And then you wrote this novel about historical fiction, which is one of my favorite. I'm a huge Ken Follett fan, or I don't know if you know Bernard Cornwell. Huge Cornwell fan. Did you, you have you even heard of Cornwell? Because nobody else has. No, I'm not Cornwell. Um, I, know, I know Ken Follett. I mean, I, I know his work. Yeah, but um, yeah. Well, check out Cornwell if you get a chance. Well, you make it a note. British version of Ken Follett. And uh, I, I had to read him at OCS. I had to read Sharps Rifles in Officer Candidate School in the Army. And uh, he wrote tons of historical fiction. In fact, there's a. I think it's a. I don't know if it's HBO. The Last Kingdom are all based on his historical fiction books mm -hmm. about. Alfred Wessex of the founding being of anyway, totally digressing. Sorry, show about you, but Cornwell's great. I just love turning people on to good books. So tell me about your first about how you transitioned into painting and then books, and then tell me about your book. Well, so first off, I've always painted, always. Um, since I was a kid, six years old, always been into it. Never been trained to do any of it. Um, although I have um been trained with or, or painted with a guy named JD Miller out of Dallas, Texas, uh, at Samuel and yeah, Samuel Lynn Galleries. And so his work is wonderful. Um, if I could only be as good as he is, I'd be lucky. But when we sold, um, you know, our buyer did not want me there. They decided they wanted just a clean break, which is fine. So I had nothing to do. So I traveled for a little bit and I'd always thought I was going to write a book. I thought the book was going to be about, you know, how you build a basement, a basement up kind of business, you know, one of those boring nonfiction kind of things. I wasn't on like my top thing to do. I traveled a lot and we were in the middle of the Selma project. So I was trying to, you know, we were moving, we moved into this house on July of 2017. So I moved. So right there, Selma, just, I know what that is. Cause I'm, I live near you, but 90% of the people listening don't know what Selma is. And I think it's cool. Selma is a, it's a well, it's a part of the old Mason track. The brother of George Mason, who was Tom, Thompson Mason inherited this land from his mother, actually, pretty much all the land north of Leesburg. Um, she gave it to him, obviously. And this house that we're living in now was built by his grandson, Armistead Mason, who was one of the youngest senators ever to serve in the U.S. Senate. He was um, 28 when he took his, took his seat. He was a, a lieutenant colonel and then a general in the War of 1812. He was responsible for, save, from, for saving Norfolk from being invaded by um, Admiral Cockburn, Coburn, if you pronounce his name properly. Although the Americans always call it you know, Cockburn, but it's Coburn. Um, Coburn. In, in, uh, 18, on Cranny Island, he was the one that fought the British back in Cranny Island, 1814. Uh, I'm sorry, 1813. And then 1814, he was um, a general uh, leading a, a, a brigade, a regiment actually, up at um, Baltimore on Hampstead Hill during the whole Fort McHenry thing. So he's, he, he built this home originally. It burned in 1896 and was a part of it still remains, um, but it was rebuilt, the main part of the mansion, in 1902 by a grain importer, a guy named um, Elijah Brokeborough White, whose father was a Civil War colonel kind of guy, uh, White's to Manchies. Long story short, the, the house had sat abandoned since 1999. I saw it on Facebook. One of my friends from college had posted it saying, does anybody know what this house is? And I kind of recognized it. When I realized it was Selma, my heart broke. Didn't sleep for three days. I called a real estate friend of mine. Said a, a friend of mine. And I said, "I want to buy that house." And she goes, "Well, it's not for sale." And I go, "Everything's for sale. Just go find the owner." And I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. I told my husband about this, and he's like, "We're gonna do what?" <laughs> this place was so bad. Vines covered it. It was, it was dilapidated. I met with him. He didn't want to sell the place, uh, and so um, we sort of discussed it, and he saw things my way eventually. We started the renovation right away, um, 15 months in. We had 60 people working here at any given time. And we used the house for philanthropic uh, events. We underwrite those events, host them here um, as part of our way of giving back um, to the community. Uh, and there's other things we're doing. As a matter of fact, uh, we'll talk about some of for a second. I'm about to close on another property um, tomorrow in Leesburg. Oh, really? That is also, uh, it's on King Street. It's uh, the Lynch House. 
the realtor I had taken me through this said to me, he said, Sharon, are you sure you really want to do this? I said, this is the walk in the park, babe, <laughs> compared to what we did. This one done. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're going to convert it into a B&B. The plan is, is that all the proceeds from that B&B be invested into my foundation and back into the community. That's fantastic. So tell us about your foundation. Um, what does your foundation do? It's called the uh, Burtz Miller um, Family Foundation. Originally, it was the Sharon Burtz Foundation. I got married, so I changed the name. And I started in 15, late at 15, maybe early 16, when after that meeting in New Hampshire, when my son said, Mom, you know, if you give him all the money in the world, it won't make him happy. And I decided to yeah. basically contribute about 20% of our profits every year um, to the foundation wow. to invest back in the community. And so we um, support four pillars of what I believe is involved and needed for a thriving community, education, cultural and historic preservation, healthcare, and opportunity development. Because without opportunity development, you don't have anything. We we'll need a way right. to better themselves that are needy. We have sponsored a number of things. Um, we have donated $4 million to build a trauma center at the Loudon Anova Hospital. Um, we did not have a trauma center there. My brother had an aneurysm, um, nearly killed him wow. in 2015. And we got him to Fairfax. Uh, and of course, you know, he's, we've got a truck back, in, he's in ICU for uh, three, 33 days. And so we had to drive back and forth. It's just too hard for families to do that. Um, and so we need a capability here in Loudon. And so that's what we decided to do that. And then, and Deb Ado and um, Dr. Ed Puccio at the Loudon Nova Hospital system, they, they're wonderful. Um, and they've done a great job in getting us you know, to level two. So we have that capability here in the county. Education wow. programs, um, we've given up about $100,000, $130,000 to the uh, Luckett Elementary School for STEM programs, but not just STEM, STEM programs, reading programs. We built a recording engineering technologies, uh, a recording studio using engineering technology so fifth and sixth graders can learn that STEM is not just all, you know, right brain stuff. It's also, I'm sorry, all left brain stuff. It's also right brain stuff. You can excel in STEM kind of programs and make music and make beautiful art. Um, and we also d donated an art program to them as well. And then reading books and then after school programs for the underserved community that's here. Uh, one thing you'll interesting about Loudoun County is that we have six Title I schools and they get a lot of extra support and finances. There's another 20, 25 schools that have between 25 and 40% children on the poverty level. Um, and they don't write out of one status. And so we're trying to get our other friends in the community to adopt a school like we have Luckett's uh, and, and help wow. with programs that will support their activities. So we're doing that. I'm a board member actually and the chair of the Loud Museum. And we are you know, trying to preserve history. Uh, we've also helped uh, the Freedom Center, the Loudon Freedom Center. Pastor Michelle Thomas uh, restore the old enslaved grounds at Belmont Plantation right off Route 7. I can't think of all the things we've given to. A place to be for music therapy. We've donated. Yep, I know that. Yep. And so all of these efforts, all these things that we do, any of the business ventures that we're in, including any proceeds from my book, which will never happen because I can tell you right now, you don't make any money in the publishing business. Uh, all his proceeds from his winery, Amle, will um, go into the community. All the proceeds from these this B and B that I'm that I'm about to embark on will go into the community. That's just kind of what we do, um, you know. That's what we're trying to trying to help uh, other folks. But that's uh, that's the sort of a Selma, a roundabout way about the Selma story. Sorry, we got off on a tangent. No, that was a good story. I liked it. So now I want to know why people are going to buy your book, sell your book. That you we're, we're investing these proceeds in philanthropic things. You're doing that. So tell me right. why are we going to read your book? What's exciting well, about it? Now, the book I know it's historical. In 1812. Tell me more. Okay, so you see it right behind me, right? Oh, by the way, all the proceeds from my art gallery and my artwork also goes to charities. Okay, yes. even though you had an art gallery. Well, wow. we're opening that soon. You'll, you'll hear about that in a little bit in a minute. But um, as it comes to Mask of Honor, I was not even thinking about writing a book. And I'm on the Middleburg Film Festival. It's another one of the our, our charitable groups that we work with. I'm a board member, and um, I've met over the years a number of people from Hollywood and elsewhere. And there's a gentleman named Anthony McCartan, who I have become really good friends. He wrote Darkest Hour. He wrote Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, he wrote oh, yeah. Doing Everything, Two Popes. He's a good, he's from New Zealand, but he lives in London. And it's October and, and there's alcohol involved and it's late. And I'm telling him, because he asked me how things are going with the house. Because the year before, he's like, you in that house. Oh my God. So I told him about the stories that I've learned, you know, about Armistead Mason and the duel that he had fought and you know, just the crazy coincidences and, you know, 
sometimes you know the truth is stranger than than uh, fiction uh, kind of stuff. And he said to me, "You should write that. Because you really should write that. I'll help you, but you need to write that. That's a great story." And I, I'm you know, like, "I'm like, yeah, sure. Have another drink, Anthony. You know." <laughs> and then the next morning, he's like, "No, I'm dead serious. I, I'd love to see you write it. You know, let, let, let's do it." And so. There was no leads, by the way, after that. It was just share and go do it. Um, and so I started researching in October of 17 and started to actually put pen to paper or actually my computer in February of that following year of 18. And I finished it about a year. And it's the story of, it's actually, it's really not Armistead stories as it is a guy named Jack McCarty. When I started the research, I thought, you know, that Armistead would be my protagonist um, instead because he, he's the guy that built Selma, built my house. Um, but instead, the younger attorney, who's an attorney, Jack McCarty, uh, was the, the the hero of the story. He was, you know, 21, made a silly mistake, um, and sort of got goaded and baited into fighting Armistead in this duel. But it's a story of honor. It's a story of of love. It's a love story in a lot of ways. It really is all about the meaning of the power of forgiveness um, and we, what happens when we can't forgive one another. It's full of politics. I did not intend it that way. It was actually the truth. I mean, at the time, Fenton Mercer was running against Armistead for a seat in the House. And Mercer, who was part of the, the Federalist Party, which was the conservative party, cheated. They were basically you know, stacking polls with people who weren't eligible to vote. And um, Armistead was mad. And because McCarty had supported Mercer in that election, and then they got some sort of a verbal misunderstanding occurred. The duel, and the, the matter just escalated and escalated until they end up on the dueling field. The politics and the voter fraud and the cheating the election uh, and the thin skin of uh, our friend, uh, Mr., uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Mason, General Mason, all too familiar. <laughs> yeah. It's a well, it's a story that repeats itself over and over, over again, and over right? Again. Yeah, so it's interesting you say that. I, I I hear from people during this last election, don't care what side you're on. I've heard from people, right. this is the worst it's ever been, and we've never had this. And and then you think of the bull moose party and the federalists. And I mean, it happens over and over and over. Read my book, know. right? <laughs> read read yeah. my book. It's, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's that. I've spent a lot of time really trying to get, I work with a psychologist, reading their actual letters and correspondence and, and what was written about them and they wrote themselves, and trying to un- wow them and so the character development's pretty deep in this book uh, i'm pretty pleased with how that turned out but it is my first book um and it's it's going well sales are, are great uh, my publisher's very happy but it's my second book that i just finished and it's, if the editor just finished it i got a couple things i gotta change but it comes out early next year as well it's about a lawyer yeah so i figured you all these attorneys on, the, on your podcast here it is yeah. a story of um a, a attorney named pal harrison who was uh, just defending a woman who in 1872, just right after the Reconstruction period uh, after the war, in 1872 was accused of killing her four children, her husband and her aunt. And he wow. her, right. It's um, about the forensic science at the time, mental health, uh, you know, and what constitutes an, ins- an insanity plea and what doesn't. And I've had to have a number of attorneys look at it because also, the whole rules back then, you, you know, you guys had no such thing as discovery back then. Right. No, nope. yeah, UK still doesn't have it. It's a, we were the British system and they had disclosure and it, it's a weird system. You can appreciate this. The opening scene, I'm arguing a demurrer. Uh, uh, only, only in the Virginia thing. Demurrers, right? Everybody else who's not a criminal lawyer, motion to dismiss. Okay. Right. But a demurrer, right? I'm doing a demurrer pleading. I had one of my attorney friends look at it and he said, I'm impressed, Cher. I'm a press so I had too many court cases. I know too much about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, motion to dismiss or a demur in Virginia. So, <laughs> okay, Veil of Doubt, completely separate historical fiction novel from the first one. So you're the female Ken Follett. That's your. Well, I like writing male. I like writing male protagonists. I think I work too long in a man's world, and I have too many children that are boys. <laughs> so I, I kind of understand how they think. Well, you've got the woman, though, so you've got the woman who he's defending, which is interesting, too. Yeah, and she's kind so, of pretty, uh, also. Yeah. yeah, yeah Mask of Honor, um, it's available on Amazon. It's available on Kindle and Nook. Um, there's an audio book. You mentioned uh, Bernard Cornwell a minute ago. Oliver North um, wrote The Rifleman, which is kind of from the same period, and Jonathan Todd Ross did the audio book for him, 
on the rifleman, he also did my audio book on Mask of Honor. So really? I got okay. to read it, put it on in the car. I'm telling you, this guy, Jonathan Todd Ross, did a, a, an astounding job at this book. I'm a big Audible fan, Audible book listener. Yes. And uh, I actually went hunting with Ollie North once, kind of random side thing. We used to go hunting with a group of us uh, huh? back a long time ago. Anyway, what are the three things that you want listeners to take away? And I, I think really somewhere between the value of philanthropy and and the best thing you did in your business and the best thing you've done with your afterlife and your art, like what are those what are three or four things? What are those things that if we could distill down Sharon um, and your kind of, you know, what you've done and do, what are those, you know, here's my advice for life. Like don't take wooden nickels, but something better than that. In terms of the philanthropy, what I like to think is that it's not government's job to do everything for all people. It's our jobs. Right. And no, no gift is too small, you know, whether it's, you know, your, your time, it's making blankets for troops that are overseas, making cookies and having a bake sale to help, you know, a local homeless shelter, whatever your passion is, it's up to all of us to put back into our own communities. It starts here. I've always thought that, and I've always lived by that. And I, I hope everyone else does. It's not big government's job or even local government's job to take care of all needs. It's ours. As yeah. members, uh, and as part of a community to help each other. So that's one. And make sure you incorporate that response, that, that thinking into your business or uh, into your lives and whatever you do. I mean, that's what we do. One is incorporate philanthropy. So be philanthropic. And you, and and it's part of your life. And that's part of your thinking. And, you know, how you raise your children um, yeah. in terms of being, totally agree. And, and being generous. I think the second thing, um, as you asked about um, a business perspective, smartest thing I ever did, I think, was the, the planning and the focus of what I decided to do, which was, you know, the markets I wanted to get into being focused on that. I mean, narrow-minded. And I'm not narrow-minded, but I was narrow-minded about it. I didn't let myself become a distraction. And the, the smartest thing I did was go after full and open and prime contracts. Subcontracting won't get you much of anything uh, if your objective right. is to ultimately to sell. You have to have your prime contracts. And I had very few, if any, um, subcontracting roles. I was all prime. Wow. And build your experience that way. And that's the advice I gave my friend yesterday when he was asking me about starting his own company. I said, you cannot go through life subbing. I mean, thinking you're going to, you know, have that big payout in the end. If that's what you want to do. And it's hard. Right. The second thing is that I, I said to him, and I'll tell anybody else, if you look yourself in the mirror and you have any doubts at all about whether or not you should start your own business, go get a job. Yeah. You cannot have any doubts. And if you do, you, you won't be willing to, to make the sacrifices you have to make to make it work. I mean, I made a lot of sacrifices, a lot. And I worked hard and I worked all the time. And was it worth it? I suppose, yeah. You know, I have the life I have now because of it, but I don't want anybody to think that it's just a cakewalk. One out of 30 businesses make it to the 10-year mark. One out of 30. Right. Odds aren't you. Yeah. So, uh, if you're going to do that. So that's really, you know, make sure you plan for what you're trying to do and you know what you're trying to do going into it and stay focused. Stay focused. And if your baby is ugly, then don't be afraid to change your baby. <laughs> I mean, if, if you're in a business that's going nowhere. <laughs> that's an interesting metaphor. Switch the baby out. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, you, 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 the baby you can't make an ugly baby pretty ever um, in, in, gov- in government contracting. If you're pursuing opportunities in, I don't know, um, uh, on how to build baskets, how to do baskets, build baskets, and no one's buying baskets, you better be selling something else, you, you know? I mean, yeah, uh, lipstick on a pig. That's <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Right. Uh, I have all those little acronyms or sayings that you can say. And what was the third thing you asked? What, what area did you? So, and then the third thing is your art. What was the thing that got you to fit, get through and finish your book? It's the same thing that got me to build FCI from 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 you know from zero or, or thirty people in two thousand seven to five thousand people in two thousand seventeen. Is that I don't I'm, it's right. just pure determination, perseverance, and I'm not giving up. You, you know, you gotta write every day. You gotta work every day. Someone says, you know, I'm gonna start my business, but I'm out Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. I said, no, you're not. If you own your own business, you're never. If you're writing a book, you're never off. You don't get a day. Right. Yeah, I just kept at it. I worked at it. Um, I didn't give up. I think the proposal development world helped me a lot, like no pride in authorship and no ego about it, only because I've been in proposals. And you guys all know in government contracting, 
you got to put, you know, 10 pounds of crap in a two pound bag um, and you can't be afraid yeah. to cut. The first book, Mask of Honor, was 220,000 words when I finished it. Um, it closed at 106,000. Wow. Yeah. So that's, well, that's having a good editor. Yeah. You know, that's, and, well, and, and I had to make the decisions, you know, um, that said, you got to cut it. What are you going to cut? Um, what's, what's important? What's yeah. not? It was hard, hard, hard to do. Um, and I did it. And I think that if you're, no matter what it is you decide to do in life, right? Whatever it might be, follow your passions. Um, that's what we're doing now. You know, how can I, and of course, I've got that CEO mentality. So whatever I do, I've got to have some sort of P&L associated with it. It's going to go with me yeah. to my grave, Tom. It'll go with me to my grave. I cannot get away from this, this whole, you know, where's the profit and loss? Where's my balance sheet? Um, so as for the book, I mean, I'm constantly beating my publisher. I'm like, I need my numbers. What levers can I pull? They're like, it doesn't work that way. I'm like, well, yo. It's publishing. It's like owning a horse or an airplane. <laughs> You're doing it because you love it. Yeah, but I still have to, I still have to have something. It's weird that way, but, um, and oh, I got you. It's just the way I am. It's just the way I'm, I'm wired, you know, I think, uh, bottom line. And, um, I wish I, I'd known that I loved writing this much when I was you know, in my twenties, I probably wouldn't have gone into government contracting. Um, I don't know that I'd be sitting in the same chair I'm sitting in now, right? because if someone asked me, if you, if you, uh, could change your life, would you? And the answer is no. You know, because I'm who I am because of the decisions I made, good or bad. And I kind of like who I am right now. So I don't worry about that too much. But it's just perseverance. Whatever you want to do, just do it well and just keep at it, right? I paint every day. I write every day. So if I could boil this down for everybody, for the end of the show, we're like, here are the three things Sharon says is, one, incorporate philanthropy into whatever your venture is, your life, your teachings, your children. Whatever you're doing, incorporate it because it changes who you are. Second, you need to be laser focused, whether it's philanthropy, business, or your artistic passion. So that laser focus thing is kind of what I'm pulling from all of that. And then the third thing, which I really like, is you've got to do it every day. Whatever it is, whether it's business, philanthropy, or art, you've got to do it every day. And you've said that multiple times, and that resonates with me, with everything that, you know, that I've seen or done or see people who are successful. They do this, it's a habit. It's like, what's that book? Seven Highly Effective Habits or Habits of mm-hmm. Something, some book. I never read it, but it's the same thing. You're saying you've got to have a habit. And I love that. And so so that's, I think, what you've said. Does that make, does, do you agree with that? that? Do it. Just it. I mean, do it every day. I mean, it's your life. It's your passion, right? I mean. Do it every day should be your motto. I like that. Do it every day. Do it every yeah. day. Because uh, people don't. Uh, and if you don't do it every day, it doesn't get done. I mean, it just doesn't. You, you don't develop, if you know what I'm saying. You don't, yeah. you know, your talent doesn't get better. It's funny. I had to listen to, to actually listen to Mask of Honor. I mean, to read it all the way through. I had to listen to Jonathan Todd Ross uh, on the Audible because if I read it, I find things I don't like. I find things that I yeah. would write now because I wrote that you know a couple of years ago. Um, and now the book I'm writing now, um, when I'm just starting now about the Civil War, is my writing is just so different because I write every day. I've gotten better. I mean, I didn't know what a bad right. I was until an editor got a hold of me. I mean, a real editor, not like a proposal editor, but I mean, a real one. Well, thank you, Sharon, for your time. Appreciate it. Thank I'm, you. I, I want to thank, yeah, and, th- and thank you listeners for listening to Black Letter Podcast again. Download us wherever you get your podcasts from on the Apple iTunes Store or the Google Play Store. We'll see you next time on the Black Letter Podcast. Thank you. That's all for today's episode of Black Letter. Thanks again for listening. Join us next time when we talk about more Black Letter issues in creative ways. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Google Play so you never miss an episode. And to catch us on video, check out our website at blackletterstudios.com.